Okay. And so a very good morning to all. Uh, continuing with the webinar series for this year. Uh, today we have Dr. Ramya, a consultant periodontist and implant logist. She's an avid, she's an avid academician and practitioner. And I know Ramya from almost now eight to nine years. She's graduated from the prestigious Amrita University and was awarded master's degree with excellence in periodontics with a gold medal from Kaylee Belgam. She pursued her training in advanced perioplastic surgeries, lasers, and soft tissue augmentations around the implants and around the teeth. And uh, Ramya is also a fellow of International College or Congress of Oral Implant Logists. And as I uh, speak to you, I have known, as I told you, I know Ramya from almost eight, nine years now. And uh, she is a more, uh, I should say, a dedicated and phonetic periodontist. So uh, has a lot of abundant knowledge. And uh, uh, with this small age of uh, her speciality has gained a lot of exp expertizations. So I will... Uh, we, this presentation will be moderated by Dr. Deepak and myself, and you all can, the viewers can post your questions uh, in the post in the chat box, and later on we can take it uh, at the end of the session. So I really want you to uh, listen carefully to the presentation, friends, because today we are in the world of aesthetics implantology, and uh, we are going to have more challenges with the implants which are going to be placed by our colleagues around the world, the nation and the world. So we, how to maintain them, how to handle them, how to get the uh, aesthetics outcome is very important in the market where people are placing implants in single day and restoring. Because after this presentation, you may uh, feel the importance, but to begin with, you may feel it very funny because when a patient, when a dentist is placing an implant with basal implants in a single day and restoring, uh, for him, the value and importance of aesthetics is not at all there. For him, it is that we just place an implant and restore it, however it looks. But as in professional endodont, professional implantologists, we, for the endoscious implants, Take minute care and minute uh, uh, take care of minute details also. How a crown or our restoration looks adjacent to the so our natural teeth. So this uh, minuteness makes us to realize that even suturing becomes very important sometimes because most of the time we would have learned two or three suture techniques in our graduations and post graduations. But micro suturing is a different science and art which has to be skilled, which I myself have been trying to learn from almost eight to nine years now. And it is, it's, 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 it's a, a learning uh, thing through the years. So I would uh, want all my study club uh, fellows to uh, um, listen it carefully and try to practice in their, in their um, routine practice of implant procedures. Over to you, Ramya, now, and we will take, as I said, the questions uh, in the end. And okay. uh, here, Dr. Midula will be changing yourself. You can just say her to change the slide. Okay, sir. Yeah. This is, I think, this is not the first slide, Ramya? Yes, sir, that's the first slide. Okay, fine. Over to you. Oh, thank you, sir. Mithila, can you make it in a full screen? It's a full, full screen. I think everybody's seeing a full screen, right? Yeah. It's completely a screen now. Full screen. I request all the participants to mute till the end of the presentation. Except Dr. Ramya speaker, uh, all the audio should be muted. Can we start? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, 
a very good morning to one and all so uh, as you all know suturing does not only mean to approximate two flat edges together but also to stabilize the wound in other words uh, it also means to stabilize the wound or to maintain the stability of blood clot which is seen underneath the tissue uh, can you change this slide nandla next slide so as you see here uh, suturing also means to stabilize the blood clot which you are able to appreciate below that uh, suture thread we basically aim to stabilize this blood clot for a better healing uh, result uh, next uh there are so many classifications of suture material from non resorbable resorbable ones and uh, again it can be classified as braided monofilament and all those things but still uh, next slide mithila we in all our clinics we land up, land up in uh, choosing either the silk suture or the vicral suture in spite of having so many classifications and so many different variety of suture in our clinic the most prevalent prevalent ones will be like either silk suture or the absorbable in the absorbable ones it will be a vicral suture next slide so the surgeons uh, choose the suture material based on the tradition they follow with the treatment or the habit or whatever the rise of the material some will be like going with the cheapest one or some will be preferring the costly one but rarely any clinician will look into the chemical properties or the biomechanical properties of a suture and go ahead with a specific suture however the selection of suture material in implant as well as in mucogingival surgeries are basically on the personal choices of every dentist they won't follow any scientific data which further has not been extensively investigated next slide so uh, do you think it uh, doesn't make any sense to go with a 30 or 40 silk suture when you are in a position to when you are going to work with a uh, small minutest uh, tissue like interdental papilla it doesn't make sense to go ahead with a 30 or a 40 suture which can take up a load up to many kilo kilograms to suture such a tiny thing i don't think it is the best option available so how do we choose what kind of suture material to be used what thread to be used is what i'm going to discuss now so once again a very good morning to one and all so the topic for my today's presentation will be suture specifications in mucogingival surgeries specifically around dental implants so when you go for a perioplastic surgery around a dental implant what kind of suture should be you be, you should be using or what kind of needle you should be using i'll be covering it uh, in detail see uh, there is a uh, unique thing about this perioplastic surgery around the tooth as well as around the dental implant why because we are placing the harvested tissue on a vascular non shedding surface so it won't be uh, the same in perioplastic around the tooth and the perio same perioplastic around the implant because in implant the blood uh, the tissue is going to stay on the blood clot which is adhere to the an artificial substance like implant so you should be always careful in getting that blood clot stabilized to that or st uh, stabilized or adhere to that implant surface so how can we make that blood clot stay there and how can we promote a better healing or how can we achieve a um, 100% success rate in this grafting procedure how we are going to go about with that uh grafting procedures around an implant with uh, all the suture uh, specifications is what i'm going to deal with next slide so when the proper suturing technique using the right thread size and right needle size and the thread diameter is being followed we are going to achieve a tension free closure around the perioplastic surgery around the implants and hence we are going to promote a healing by primary intention next slide 
So what exactly is this blood clot which I was talking about? What is the significance of this blood, blood clot? As all the periodontists know, uh, the thinner the blood clot, the greater the acceptance of the uh, graft. I want the others also to know that there is uh, some basic uh, knowledge which you require in the anatomy, in the tissue vascularity, and the interaction properties of this blood clot, which is seen underneath the graft or underneath any advancement flap or any, um, any flap uh, procedures you go ahead in your clinical practice. So coming to the blood clot properties, it is actually a kind of uh, viscoelastic polymer. Polymer means it contains uh, many kinds of fibers. So basically here, it consists of a thinner fibrin fibers and a thicker collagen fibers. When you see some patients with, uh, who are patients who are diabetic or who are obese, their blood contains more of um, thicker collagen fibers than compared to a normal individual. So when you go ahead with any procedures related to those procedures, you have to keep in mind is that the blood clot that is going to happen, that is going to form underneath this tissue is having a thicker collagenous properties. That means uh, the mechanical property varies. We have to control uh, the resorption time using our technicalities of uh, raising a flap or suturing or placing an implant. You have to minimize the blood present underneath the flap. Then only you are able to achieve a better healing or a good aesthetic result. So how can you control this uh, mechanical properties of the uh, blood clot underneath? We can control it by the pressure we are going to apply it on the overlying flap by the way of sutures. So the fibrin fiber is more elastic than collagen. Even though we say that the fibrin fiber, which is so, uh, normally most commonly seen in the normal individuals is more elastic. Uh, but when you extend it beyond a limit, that is when you use a suture um, of three zero size, where you are supposed to use a six zero or seven zero uh, suture material, you go with a three zero suture and you're put, putting more pressure on that uh, overlying flap, you're gonna uh, give um, more load or uh, an increased amount of load on the blood clot, you are gonna thin out that blood clot, which ultimately leads in the graft failure or uh, uh, problems related to the healing. So the clinician actually can influence the resorption time of the clot by the forces that we bring on to the clot. Next slide. You can see the SCM image of a, a right side. What you see is a thin fibrous clot over there. And the left side is a thick collagenous fibers. In case of obese and diabetic people, there will be more of thick collagenous flap. So you have to put a little bit more pressure to make it slightly thinner compared to the uh, people who uh, people who have more thinner uh, fibrin fibers in their blood, like normal individuals who, is, who does not have any associated medical issues. Next slide. So choosing a thinner suture diameter, as I said, like going ahead with a 6 0, 7 0, uh, or 8 0 suture, we can define the force that we bring on to the tissues. That is, we are applying very minimal pressure over there, here I'm talking about normal individuals, uh, uh, not with any medical uh, uh, complications. So when we use 6070 or 80 sutures in such kind of thing, we are actually putting very minimal pressure on the uh, superficial flap. And hence we are providing that adequate amount of blood underneath your uh, graft material so that the graft is able to survive from the um, uh, uh, from the growth factors which is coming out from, uh, from the underlying blood component. So thereby we can influence the tension brought to the wound margin and uh, thereby we are getting a blood clot which is like really beneficial for the uh, better healing results. So um, um, you can see here there are a, a white color suture here, a blue color one and a black color one. So the white color suture is a cytoplast suture used and the blue color is a vicral suture used and the black is a normal silk suture. So whenever you go ahead with suturing, uh, don't try to put on excessive pressures like using all sort of suture material over there. Every suture you use is, to create a, is uh, going to create a new wound over there, which will take another uh, week uh, to epithelize and heal thereafter. 
so when you consider the clot on one side with the clot has to be an it should be looking like an open structure that with less pressure less tension so that the uh, nearby endothelium can penetrate inside the blood and provide the uh, required growth make growth factors around the uh, implant area but on the other side it should be firm also to resist all the forces like mastication when the uh, patient smiles all those forces it should not um, open up so you should be working on uh, you should be working on with such sutures which will provide you with all such uh, qualities next slide you can here in this scm picture you can see the capillary ingrowth happening for in ideal cases you should um, have a structure of the blood clot in which it is little bit loose but it is not that loose it will open up with a small mastication or any um, uh, any patient's normal uh, phonetics or anything like that so the cells from the adjacent endothelium or from the surrounding capillaries will ingrow but if the clot is under tension means this lumen formation will never ever happen and your graft is going to fail next slide here you can see uh, they have done a coronally advanced flap in relation to the uh, tooth and when the when they move the buccal mucosa the graft is also moving that means the underlying clot is not getting stabilized the graft the coronally advanced flap is also not stabilized here the graft is going to fail for sure because it is not going going to get a proper uh, adherence to the underlying connective tissue bed there is no proper vasculature happening to the coronally advanced area and the graft is going to fail the way they sutured is also different so how we go about with suturing such cases is what i'm going to tell you in a study conducted by rhino burkadet Uh, in which he studied the influence of suture tension to the tearing characteristics of the soft tissue he found out that when we for the perioplastic or uh, any mucogingival surgeries around the implant when the tissue trauma is reduced by choosing finer suture diameters uh, the graft success rate was more or um, if we, when we use uh, sutures of 6070 70 or any uh, sutures in the ha uh, higher numbers they found out that that when the tension is increased uh, the suture thread breakage is happening more than the tissue breakage so we need maximum uh, stability for the soft tissue over there because already the it is a grafted tissue it is very fragile we don't want any extra burden on that soft tissue to be uh, formed in that area so higher the uh, like uh, more you choose the suture materials on that range you are going to uh, you are able to control the mechanical stability that is the mechanical stability of the grafted tissue so i always suggest you to go ahead with the 6070 70 or 80 sutures in case of mucogingival surgeries or any perioplastic surgeries you do around the tooth or or the implant but uh, the sutures which we normally prefer like the 3040 you can go with the normal extraction cases or any areas where the tissues you feel more amount of keratinized tissue is there or the tissue is able to withhold all the forces withstand all the forces in such cases go ahead with the 30 suture like sil suture which is like little bit comparatively cheaper and cost effective but when you go ahead with a little aesthetic procedures always try to prefer sutures in the range of 6050 50 or 70 that range next slide so coming to the classification which we were uh, which we know from our bds years like we have absorbable sutures which is again classified as synthetic natural in synthetic we have multifilament and monofilament in multifilament we have polyglycolic acid or and polyglactin and in monofilament we have polydeoxinone or polyglyconate and in case of natural we have catgut collagen even though we have so many classification in all our clinics we will see either the silk material or maybe to the max we can see a polyglycolic acid suture but preferably we will go with the vicryl or the um, silk sutures next slide in non -absor absorbable sutures again we have synthetic and natural in synthetic uh, multifilament it includes nylon polyester and stainless steel monofilament you have the nylon polyethylene polyester polypropylene and stainless steel and in natural material you have uh, silk linen cotton and metal wire in case of a multifilament 
in all in every cases we even in even if it is a implant surgery we'll go with the silk multifilament in 99 percentage of our cases we'll choose that material but instead try choosing something like nylon or polydioxinon or polydioxinon fast absorbing things it will give you that kind of result aesthetic results which you which you which you are expecting uh, from from the um, procedure so always choose the suture material also with that much of importance like your suture what implant i should place what kind of abutment should i be using the same way go ahead with your suture material also that will show the results when you go or when you choose the material correctly next slide as i said the most commonly preferred one is the 30 silk silk suture next slide so how do you choose which suture material you should use in case of a mucogingival or a perio perioplastic surgeries or on dental implants so it basically depends on the healing characteristics of the tissue if you feel that uh, the tissue is able to heal properly that is a healthy tissue go for something like fast absorbing polyglycolic acid suture instead of silk choosing silk suture go ahead with something like that and if you feel that the tissue is very flabby it is not going to uh, um, regain its uh, pre surgical strength anyways in such cases go for poly, plain to a polyglycolic acid suture try some variations try to figure out try to modify your practice by uh, getting new suture materials and try it out how it is working and what is the aesthetic results it's going to bring in i am i can definitely say that when you go ahead with such suture modifications the results which you get from this plastic surgeries will also vary to a, a hell lot now the second point will be like uh, depending on the physical and biological properties of the suture material because uh, in there are many recent modifications in which they incorporate uh, electronic sensor they incorporate uh, uh, antibiotics inside the suture material they'll make the suture material barbed there are so many modifications are there go uh, choose the materials based on that also and the condition of the wound i said if if you feel it is uh, area is slightly infected go ahead with the or you have placed uh, bone graft you have placed the gtr membrane and you want the area to be completely infection free just try using antibiotic loaded suture material also and the probable post operative course of the patient next slide always keep in mind that every suture bite you give in that area which is like very precise which has to be precisely handled will act as a a uh, source of infection which can impede your um, healing result so every suture bite you give give it very minimally just to hold that uh, just to stabilize that graft material or just to stabilize your uh, gtr membrane don't keep on giving like uh, like uh, hell number of sutures uh, just to make sure that everything is tightly packed it is not the way if you give uh, more amount of mechanical tension or may more amount of uh, tightness to that suture area your blood clot is going to thin to that extreme that your suture is going to fail for sure next slide so uh, if you feel that there is a risk of peri implantitis or any post operative infection and uh, you have to keep a check on the uh, amount of bacterial load that is going to come inside that surgical area try to minimize the suture because uh, uh, most probably or preferably we go with the silk or a vicol suture there will be wicking effect try to minimize the uh, number of bites at, at least so basically the risk of infection depends on the bacterial addition and the physical and chemical properties of the selected sutures next slide so as i said among the non absorbable suture um, according to uh, many studies it's uh, always better to go ahead with the nylon uh, rather than the silk because nylon should be considered as a first target suture than silk because it can tolerate higher tensile load and it has the lowest load of bacterial accumulation followed by silk uh, followed by your normal followed by your silk suture and in case of complex mucogingival surgeries never try to uh, go with a non resorbable suture never try to hamper that area for at least a period of 14 to 28 days just that area remain like that in such cases uh, always choose an absorbable suture like vicryl or vicryl plus vicryl plus means it has it is having a triclosan coating which is an antibacterial coating which will 
reduce the bacterial load that is going to encounter in your surgical area so when in normal uh, extraction cases you can prefer your silk suture which is cost effective but in case of muco gingival surgeries if you feel that uh, the you have uh, done heart tissue grafting or you have placed any membrane always go with the resorb uh, non resorbable suture like vicryl vicryl plus or uh, something like something in that category and if it is like a normal implant placement where you feel it is okay to go ahead with a, a non resorbable one please try to choose this nylon suture which uh, will show you the benefit next slide second one uh, the second point which i want to convey is that there are circumstances in which the intraoral tissues most likely will never ever regain the pre operatory strength that is like uh, while opera or while operating you have removed most of the keratinized tissue from that area and you feel the tissues are little flabby and it won't take up the strength when you go for the implant surgeries you have done a corys technique and there is no keratinized gingiva around your uh, surgical site in such cases always try to go with something like conventional polyglycolic acid suture rather than choosing your normal silk suture or any vicryl suture you need little bit strength over there also Converse, conversely when you feel that the tissue approximation is faster uh, you can change the pga with pga plus that is polyglycolic acid plus next next slide here in this picture you can see they have placed a, a titanium reinforced gtr membrane and on top of that they have placed something uh, like a white suture white white suture this is called as a cytoplas suture this is in this is trending nowadays what happens is that it can prevents that um, load bacterial load from uh, the wicking phenomena it is actually a wide dye free material that makes uh, identifying the suture once a patient comes after like uh, 14 days also you are able to identify even if uh, there is mild amount of inflammation you can see even the minutest suture you have placed over there and you can remove it it has high tensile strength and not security uh but uh, little bit technic sensitivity uh, is there where, when we deal with the cytoplas suture because when you place the cytoplas suture you have to give minimum seven throws uh normally in silk suture uh, we go for three to uh, two to three throws but in cytoplas suture you have to go for seven throws for that not security as high tensile strength and not security is there it will prevent the wound from reopening like uh, you have placed um, uh, plates over there you have placed uh, autographs that is the size is little bulkier and you have put the particle graft in between like exactly like uh, what you go in corys corys technique you have placed in that mode and on top of that you have uh, gone with the pedicle connected tissue graft like it's like a bulkier procedure and in such cases i prefer you to go with the Uh, along with the vicryl suture or resorbable suture in the main area you can go with the cytoplas suture also which will give you the strength from the wound from reopening so this is a, a trending suture nowadays please try to use this suture if you are going up going ahead with some muco gingival surgeries which are really like um, extensive ones next slide you can see the cytoplas ptfe suture it is little costlier and you can see the pga f uh, fast absorbing suture also the cytoplas suture may basically consist of poly tetrafluoroethylene monofilament which does not allow the bacterial wicking into the surgical site so that you can keep it at that place because you are you have done an extensive muco gingival procedure uh, in relation to the implant you don't want any kind of bacterial contamination over there kindly uh, go ahead with using cytoplast uh, suture in such cases and it is and the patient will also be very convenient to use that because uh, it is very soft and it is biologically inert and when the patients move try to feel the suture with the tongue also they will be like very much uh, it is very much satisfying from the patient side also next slide next so basically what i am trying to convey is for any periodontal and peri implant surgery try to choose the uh, suture diameter in the range of 60 to 80 which actually reduces the risk of uh, tearing the soft tissue and improves the passive flap adaptation never go for an active flap adaptation because when you go for an active flap adaptation the flap is going to compress the uh, uh, the blood clot which is seen underneath from where the growth factors everything uh, the the graft is going to take 
because in the initial one or two days that is the only source of uh, blood supply for your harvested crop so try to maintain that uh, blood clot underneath the, the thin layer of blood clot underneath the uh, graft by providing a passive flap uh, adaptation but in case of Im normal implant procedures or where you use a gbr procedure you can go ahead with 40 or 50 diameter for mucogingival surgeries prefer monofilament sutures because you want that area to be like uh, bacterial free or you want to reduce the bacterial load next slide coming to the needle you choose and the suture strand you choose now uh, as you all know the surgical needles are basically made of heat treated stainless steel with a coating of micro silicon on top of that uh, next slide so the, what are the factors for the ideal suture needle basically you have to choose a suture needle based on the thickness and the accessibility of the tissue to be sutured the importance of attaining a good cosmetic result and the size of the suture material and mm, definitely the cost next slide so uh, you all know that there are eyed and eyeless suture i always prefer eyeless suture in case of a mucogingival surgery because it's less traumatic and you don't have to pass the thread uh, like uh, mm, the uh, needle point through the graft also because there is like uh, next slide you can see the needle eye when this kind of needle eye passes through the grafted tissue you are going to traumatize the tissue you are going to tear the tissue the tissue will be all the more fragile tissue already is in a fragile state when you pass such kind of thing it the tissue will become all the more fragile so uh, better to go with the eyeless needle in mucogingival surgeries in case of mucogingival surgeries next slide the advantages of eyeless needles are it is always less traumatic to the grafted area and you can make sure that each patient has the benefit of a new sharp and guaranteed sterile needle which from the patient point of view is definitely a good factor to consider and there is no accidental unthreading of the needle and losing it while suturing and it is faster and more efficient procedure you just have to merely code the code number to the surg uh, surgical assistant and they can easily hand it over to you next slide now coming to the needle body um, from our theory part we all we already know that there are around oval side flattened rectangular triangular trapezoidal and the longitudinal shape it will be like half curved curved or compound curve next slide so for the perio and for the perioplastic and uh, uh, implant surgeries always go ahead with a half circle or 3 by 8 circle because you have to uh twist your needle in many ways in perioplastic as well as implant surgery for soft tissue fascia uh for soft tissue fascia the taper needle round cross section is preferably uh, uh preferably the ones to be to chosen next slide coming to the needle point there are conventional needle points and they are reverse cutting the cutting ones are ideally used for suturing keratinized tissue like skin palatal mucosa buccal and alveolar mucosa when you go for implant placement normal implant placement you can go ahead with the cutting needle but when you go with the um, sinus membrane augmentation where there is a tear you want to place a gtr membrane over there and you suture always prefer reverse cutting needle next slide and the needle size or the needle curvature always i uh, prefer you uh, prefer you to work with a 3 by 8 curvature because the flexibility that the 3 by 8 curvature gives you in case of a perioplastic as well as uh, the membrane uh, the sinus augmentation techniques is commendable when we come too close to the teeth or suturing a releasing incision you can choose choose a half circle needle next slide this is little bit complex when you go for zygomatic implants there are va uh, various uh, needle specifications like plastic plastic skin you can see p written ps written uh, premium uh, pre needles written over there and in such cases there are uh, i think it will be like uh, whoever goes with the zygomatic implants they can read about this uh, they can go with the non absorbable suture pc1 p3 or pre1 needle for thick and skin areas they can go ahead with 40 vicryl which is a normal one or fs2 that is for skin to or cutting and four needles these are all for uh, facial tissues uh, and if you are going ahead with the zygoma implants and all you can refer this slide 
next slide now coming to the needle tip um when dealing with coarse tissue the needle tip should be sharp coarse tissue means when the when the thickness of the keratinized tissue is more and you feel that you have to penetrate many number of um, tissue membranes and all those things you please go ahead with the sharp needle needle tip but when suturing membranes in the sinus augmentation go with the uh, round needle tip next slide there is something known as cut out uh, phenomena that happens when you go with a uh, conventional cutting needle that means uh, the example is like uh, if you want to uh, go with go ahead with some papillary augmentation technique where you want to uh, go for a interdental papillary fill procedures at that time never go with the conventional cutting needle because uh, the conventional um, cutting needle will tear off the papilla and your suture needle uh, along with the suture thread is going to come out because the cutting ends in the conventional needle is on the upper surface and compared to the reverse cutting needle so reverse cutting needle which you can see on the second uh, picture it can actually hold your suture if you are going for a papillary augmentation techniques so always try to go with the go ahead with the reverse cutting needles in case of papillary procedures like interdental papillary fill or any papillary augmentation procedures you uh, do related to your implant procedures next slide so uh, uh, this is like the basic suture uh, packet that comes you can identify your product code which is given as 910131 the needle code with life size picture of your needle and choose your needle very correctly and never blindly pick any needle and go ahead with uh, uh, like uh, for all the procedures kindly choose the needle wisely that will show the result and the needle length that is 70 mm which is written over there and the point type is shown over there and the needle circle whether it is a half circle or 3 by 8 circle for perioplastic and implant surgery definitely choose 3 by 8 or half by half circle needle and the color and the strand length uh, the material is also given please choose the material wisely instead of choosing only silk or vicryl to something different and at least give once uh, give a try once or twice and see the results by yourself you can actually definitely make out how effectively the wound has healed in in that particular area next slide so the principles of suturing um, you know that um, always hold the needle at one third from the needle tip and uh, the first bite should be like when you take the bite always enter the tissue perpendicularly the needle should be passed through the tissues along its curve and the suture should be passed at an equal depth and distance from the incision on both the sides next slide these are the uh, basics which we already know from our previous times and holding the needle never hold at the uh, needle point that is the eye point uh, next one and the needle should always pass from the movable tissue to the fixed tissue when you go for a grafting procedures uh, take a bite on the graft first and then go with the fixed tissue and the say the last one is the needle always uh, passes from the thinner tissue to the thicker ones next slide coming to the armamentarium uh, i think this also you will be knowing a needle holder is required it has a cross hatch so always try to lock it when you uh, do some perioplastic surgeries because you don't have to bother about uh, whether the needle will be falling out or dropping out or anything like that next slide needle holder also comes in different uh, types mayo higer olsen higer duff needle holder whichever is like convenient and whichever is like practically you feel it is convenient for your uh, uh, working protocol kindly choose a, a needle holder based on that next slide castro vaso for micro surgical uh, uh, suturing we uh, we always prefer using castro vaso needle holder and uh, the suture material also comes in that size so uh, if you are using loops and all kindly go ahead with castro vaso needle holder the precision you get with uh, suturing using micro surgical procedures is very commendable in case of uh, implant as well as perioplastic surgeries next slide tissue forceps adsen forceps tooth and not tooth brown adsen forceps is there where you can see the uh, at the end there are the last uh, the holding part has more uh, dips deep 
the brachial thoracic forceps is also there uh, if you have to enter a um, like a longer length uh, a wound surface where the depth of the wound is more you can go ahead with a de brachial thoracic, thoracic forceps like in case of uh, placing the bone grafts little deeper compared to the adjacent teeth level tooth surface level you can use this kind of forceps for holding the suture or suturing the um, suturing the membrane or your uh, soft tissue next slide suture cutting scissors uh, dian scissors is there head scissors and dp blade also you can use next slide these are the basics now coming to the main thing when you go ahead with the suture thing the suture uh, you are going to place in that uh, wound surface is going to encounter many traumas in the first uh, 24 hours the basic trauma will be from your mechanical trauma that you give during your um, procedure to the suture material so both absorbable and non absorbable suture material provide equal penetration trauma so you are the one who have to control how much mechanical trauma the uh, the suture should have to remain in that uh, surgical site for the next 7 to 14 days always handle the suture very delicately and very precisely following the wound healing that is following the wound healing period from the uh, day 3 to the 14 or 28 days the trauma from the bacterial load will be more there will be aerobic bacteria coming and aerobic bacteria coming and, and sometimes it may lead to the um, failure of your graft it will penetrate to the uh, bone particles which have placed the membrane you have placed so try to focus on uh, minimizing those bacterial load from the third day 3 to the day, uh, so 28 days so try to minimize that bacterial load how we can minimize the bacterial load is you have to prevent the wicking mechanism that happens in that suture material how we can prevent the wicking wicking mechanism you have to choose the uh, suture material based on that hence uh, you can always advise patients to have a plug control during the healing period by chlorex in mouthwash or betadine in mouthwash or asking the patients to maintain the area properly and also the suture material coated with triclosan or chlorex in is available in the market that also inhibits this bacterial load which is very crucial in the sinus augmentation techniques or your uh, soft tissue or hard tissue augmentation techniques always choose the choose the suture material very precisely in case of a mucogingival surgery next slide you can see the bacterial load this is a culture so you can see the white thing is a total colon tcf units which is a bacterial count what they do in case of microbiology the uh, picture a is a plain uncoated suture if you use a silk suture this is what going to happen if you use a plain silk suture around your valuable implant uh, like a uh, uh your uh, aesthetic procedures or your costlier implant procedures you are going to end up with something like that and the uh, second picture is a triclosan coated suture the triclosan is an antibiotic if you use that kind of suture can you see the difference and the third one is a chlorhexidine coated suture there is a study which says that if you use a chlorhexidine coated suture the bacterial load is very 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 minimal compared to the triclosan coated suture there is a controversy like uh, why uh, we have to incorporate triclosan because it's an antibiotic and again there will be like uh, the school of thoughts regarding antibiotic resistance and all those things are coming up so try to use some sutures like chlorhexidine coated suture as you can see from the picture there is like the bacterial load is reduced in to like 10 to the power of minus 1 that level next slide so the specification in suture techniques for mucogingival surgery i'm going to uh, cover like each procedure in detail next slide the procedure what you are seeing is the vip c ct technique that means vascularized interpositional connective tissue graft Uh, that has been placed over the implant for augmentation next slide so as you all know this is the most commonest thing which you always do if you are planning to go ahead with an implant placement for a particular patient you always do something called as alveolar ridge preservation you don't compress the socket and uh, if it is a molar area and all you try to give a figure of eight so why you are giving a figure of eight is like you have to bring back the elevated papilla to its original position you have to go ahead with the socket preservation by putting the bone graft or collagen plug over it and you have to suture it and you want that hold over that uh, uh, collapse plug so go ahead with the um, uh, figure of eight suture 
so while performing this figure of eight there are certain modification certain modification which has uh, been introduced how better we can give this uh, figure of eight in case of a mucogingival surgery around uh, dental implants next slide See, this is a routine suture which normally is being used. This is called as a crisscross suture. In this kind of crisscross suture, the needle engages. The first bite goes from the buckle, and the needle engages both the buckle and the lingual flap in the same direction. And you are gonna get a X pattern on the surface of your socket. I hope you are getting it. We are the first bite will come from the buckle side. and the same side you will take the second bite you will cross over the socket you will enter from the lingual side same side lingual you come out and you are going to give your tie on the uh, buckle side this is called a criss cross suture which you normally do in all like oral surgery postings and all which you normally do otherwise in your clinic also this is called criss cross suture the x pattern is created over the socket next slide there is one more modification and this is a modification of a horizontal mattress where you uh, sorry modification of a continuous suture where you uh, give a continuous suture on the surface of the socket i hope you are aware of this x and uh, criss cross and x suture see in x suture you again enter from the buckle side give a continuous suture over the socket come out through the lingual side and your knot will be tied on the buckle side a large crossed x is created over the socket after suturing so you can uh, the blue arrow actually indicate the pulling vectors that you create by giving this kind of suture can you go back to the uh, uh, like previous one in this the the blue arrow or the pulling vectors will be more towards the lingual side because you are more like trying to stretch the buccal tissue more towards the lingual side in criss cross suture next slide as well as in x suture the tissues you are trying to pull from the buccal side more towards the lingual side so imagine a situation in which you hardly have any keratinized tissue on the buccal side and you are going ahead with such a kind of situation you can see partially edentulous patient where hardly they have any keratinized tissue and you extracted the remaining tooth also and the the area you want to maintain the buccal collapse and all you don't require in such cases you if you go ahead with such kind of suture you are actually trying to pull whatever tissues are remaining over there to the lingual side and uh, the tissues on the lingual side hardly have any keratinized area uh, other than the maxilla next slide so the soft tissue profiles following um, uh, the ridge procedures uh, sutured using criss cross technique or conventional x sutures have a large loss of facial keratinized tissue and have noted that the mucogingival junction is shifted more towards the lingual side due to the pulling we give it on the buccal tissue i have shown you the blue line those are the pulling vectors you are actually pulling the tissue from the buccal and moving it to the lingual side especially when you when the when there is a buccal bone collapse and when you go ahead with x suture or criss cross suture you are pulling the buccal tissue more towards the lingual suture so ultimately when you want to do some augmentation procedures or when you want to do some aesthetic procedures you are not going to get any tissue or any mucogingival border or any keratinized tissue all these will be a matter of your concern only if you think about and think think about the implantology in a different level if you just want to place an implant uh, place a crown and send the patient all these things doesn't even matter but when the implant placement what you do is in a different level like you want the aesthetics to come up or in in such cases all these things you have to consider next slide so uh, in order to prevent that pulling effect uh, a recent uh, a recent technique has been introduced that is called as a hidden x suture in this thing the needle enters from the buccal flap and before going to the um, before coming out from the lingual side they are uh, taking the uh, needle diagonally from the dist uh, from the mesial side they are taking the first bite diagonally coming out from the lingual side and again going to the buccal side come out come come through the socket di diagonally and again come out from the lingual aspect i think uh, you got it see the needle enters the buccal flap passes to the opposite lingual side in a diagonal direction then it passes again from the buccal to the lingual side 
again in a diagonal direction. A crossed X is created under the flap, unlike the X suture or the crisscross suture. Here, the blue arrow indicates the vector created by the hidden uh, X suture. Can you see that the arrows are more towards the mesial and the distal side? They, uh, instead of pulling the buccal tissue to the lingual side, here the tension is inside, created inside the socket. Rather than pulling the tissue, buccal tissue, the buccal borders to the lingual side, you, we are not uh, hampering anything, uh, uh, anything on the mucogingival line or any keratinized tissue on the buccal aspect. So always try to use this kind of suturing techniques if you're going ahead with something like rich, rich alveolar rich preservation procedures. Next slide. Uh, you can see the hidden X suture and the X suture difference. Uh, I hope you are able to appreciate. In the X suture, there is hardly any mucogingival keratinized tissue over there. After four months, the last one, the four months picture, you can see. But in case of hidden X suture, you are able to appreciate a pretty good amount of uh, keratinized tissue over there. The application of this hidden X sutures lightly push the mucogingival line to the buc buccal side also. Next slide. So coming to the uh, most commonly and the gold standard technique we always use in case of a mucogingival surgery is a connective tissue graft. So whenever you harvest a connective tissue graft, harvesting is an entirely different topic. Now uh, imagine you have harvested a graft and you have placed it on the surface of the implant. The first suture you have to place is the holding suture. That is a simple interrupted suture that you're going to place on the de-epithelized papilla, uh, de-epithelized papillary area. And the suture specification, according to Cohen, is like the you are you're supposed to use short 8 mm uh, needle, 3 by 8 curvature needle. And, you also, uh, and the suture material should be of 7-0 and preferably, uh, so sorry, reversible and preferably 7-0. You can go ahead with 6-0 or 8-0 suture, but preferably, uh, the, uh, uh, preferably according to the literature, they suggest 7-0 suture to be used. So the first suture should be simple interrupted on the de-epithelized papilla. And the second part to consider is like, when you harvest a connective tissue graft, the bulk, the bulk of the connective tissue graft should be, should come on the surface of the implant. Next slide. The thicker central portion of the connective tissue graft should be placed on top of the surgical abutment. And the thinner lateral portion should be sutured to the de-epithelized de papilla as well as the de-epithelized uh, area which you see in that recipient bed. So uh, try to place it properly first and then go ahead with the holding sutures and periosteal suturing. Always place the suture properly. If you push the suture more coronally, that is the uh, your uh, simple interrupted, uh, you, you give the simple interrupted suture uh, after placing the graft more coronally, that more into the implant surface, you're going to lose those much of graft because of graft shrinkage, because there is no blood supply underneath. You are placing it on an avascular surface. So always try to place it exactly at the right position. Always do the simple interrupted suture, tying your graft to the de-epithelized de papilla, so that you know where your uh, alveolar bone starts, where there is tissue for the blood supply to come, and make the survival rate more uh, for the graft. Second slide, next slide. Uh, see, uh, you can see a black arrow. So then the second suturing will be there. That is called as a holding suture or you can go ahead with the periosteal suturing. Next slide. And uh, the main point to consider here in case of a connective tissue graft is whenever you try to place your knots, always uh, we have been told that knots should lie either on one side of the incision, either like on the buccal side or on the lingual, lingual side, not exactly on the incision or the graft area. But in case of connective tissue graft, always try to place the knot on top of the graft and not on the papilla. So that the knot, knot is giving ex some extra pressure on the graft to get well adapted to the underlying tissue. It always prevents, it also prevents the excessive coronal positioning of your connective tissue graft. I, I already said that when you move your graft more coronally and you suture it, try to suture it in a very fancy way, you're going to lose the graft because of the graft shrinkage. The outward projection of the graft apically, which you see with the black arrow, is fixed with the periosteal suturing. Next slide. 
uh, I think you are able to appreciate. I want you guys to uh, concentrate on the needle holder area. This is a periosteal suturing. See, we usually give the periosteal suture at the mesial and the distal line angles of the graft. You can give it at the uh, center. See, you can give it at the center portion also. But uh, when you give it exactly at the midway, uh, you are going to give your one or uh, like few of your bites will be on the cheek mucosa. So better try to avoid it. If you are able to get a proper adaptability, proper stability with the holding suture and the periosteal suture given mesial and distal, never go for that uh, intermediate, uh, that suturing at the center of the, see, how will I tell you? Uh, Midula, can you take the uh, arrow to the, like first picture, next to the needle holder, exactly at the center. Uh, can you move more distally, distally from the needle holder? Can you move more distally from the needle holder? Uh, you can see, uh, yeah, more distally, more distally. Uh, can you place it on the upper border, the arrow? Yeah, try to avoid suturing at this area because uh, one or like a few bites will, you will be engaging it at the mu uh, like movable mucosa, your cheek mucosa. So if you're getting a better stability, go ahead with the interrupted and the periosteal suturing. Next slide. So in periosteal suturing, we normally go ahead with the vertical mattress kind of suture. The needle first takes the bite from the graft, that is from the movable tissue. You go deep inside the graft and under the vertical incision, when you try to re-enter from the, uh, uh, re-enter through the immovable tissue, try to get an anchorage from the underlying periosteum also. So your first bite go to the, uh, first bite goes to your graft, the second bites to your underlying periosteum. And when you re-enter, try to re-enter through the proper stable mucosa. That is called periosteal anchorage. The suture is finished with the surgeon's knot on the graft, not on the uh, uh, immobile tissue. Always finish your suture or finish your surgeon's knot on top of the graft because you are compressing the graft and thereby providing a thinner blood clot for faster healing and better healing. Next slide. This technique, as I said, minimizes the coagulum formed under the tissue and reduces the graft stringage. So ideally only this much of suturing is required, but most of the times I have seen people using almost like uh, 10 to 15 uh, bites and trying angry sutures and all those things. But try to minimize the number of bites and minimize the number of suture. Your graft is very precious. Don't keep on putting like uh, uh, small, small uh, suture tracks inside that. It's gonna shred your graft and the result which you're gone, gonna get from the shredded graft is very pathetic and try to minimize the uh, number of sutures or number of uh, throws you put on that, or sorry, number of bites you take it through the graft. Next slide. Coming to the vertical mattress sutures, vertical mattress sutures, I know all uh, everybody know, uh, all the participants know, but uh, in case of implant surgery, we give vertical mattress sutures. I, uh, otherwise, I want you people to give the vert vertical mattress sutures in the areas of papilla. It, if you give this vertical mattress sutures, again, the vertical mattress sutures can be like internal vertical mattress sutures and external vert vertical mattress sutures. These are the basics. But um, I am I'm not going to explain what is internal vertical mattress and external vert vertical mattress. But this vertical mattress, in case of implant surgery, try to give it at the papillary area so that you prevent any unwanted apical pressure on the tip of the papilla. So when you go ahead with an implant aesthetic in relation to the anteriors, when you put a simple interrupted and then you excessively give a tight pressure to tie the knot, you're putting some unnecessary pressure on that area. And uh, it is going to sink inwards, like towards the interdental bone. And you will land up in something like black triangle formation. So try to avoid simple interrupted over there. If you have space and if you have the... Uh, uh, like technicality, always go ahead with the vertical matter suture in that area, which may uh, like uh, which may prevent the black triangle formation between the teeth. Next slide. Horizontal matters again. Uh, if there is a block bone graft place over there, above that you place a GTR membrane where you need actually a proper buckle to lingual flap adaptation completely. Try giving a horizontal matter suture instead of giving like uh, two to three interrupted sutures over there. Try to give a horizontal matter sutures 
uh, and try to provide a free primary closure or in that um, implant site area next slide modified horizontal mattress suture is there so um, i think this is one of the easiest horizontal mattress you can uh, try give a try in so when you go for a implant placement a normal implant placement where there is bone no bone graft or anything like that you just want to cover that uh, incision line in in such scenario what you are supposed to do is like uh, next slide see here the needle enters the buccal side i want you guys to see the picture a eh? the needle enters from the buccal side or the labial side of the tissue distal to the implant distal to the implant enter the tissue and again enter on the mesial lingual tissue and exit and from the lingual side you do the same thing enter from the lingual side and come out and you have to tie a knot on exactly at the middle of your implant so that so that you are putting some pressure on the implant surface as well as the abutment whichever the scenario is so the advantages of such kind of scenario is like it will avert the wound margins to a certain extent and it can control certain post operative hemorrhages from the gingiva around the tooth surface which is like a matter of consideration in case of implants the main disadvantage with this kind of horizontal mattress is like it will actually uh, if you don't do it precisely it will compress the neck of the tissue like a neck of the uh, neck tissue surrounding the neck of the implant over constriction can lead to reduced blood supply and the area won't heal properly so uh, if you are able to handle that portion properly this is one of the best suture you can give surrounding any implant or surrounding any, any abutment that is called modified horizontal mattress suture which you normally give around implant procedure around the, around the implants next slide so uh, one point you you have to consider is like when going for a gtr membrane suturing always go from the um, membrane side never try to follow the routine protocol of entering from the labial side trying to the uh, lingual side always try the other way around try to go from the crustal side to the facial side using a reverse cutting needle so that you don't penetrate the membrane imagine the same thing happening on the uh, sinus membrane also try to enter from the crustal side or the from the membrane side to the facial surface so that way you can prevent uh, unnecessary tearing of the membrane which you have placed after like uh, after doing so much of effort you are like place the membrane properly you don't want the membrane to move away from that exact location try to move it the other way around from the crustal to the facial side next slide coming to periosteal suturing this is the suturing technique which istban arban has uh, introduced not introduced he has like uh, uh, populated this technique uh, propagated this technique next slide see uh, imagine a situation of uh, where you have to go ahead with the heart tissue augmentation you have placed the bone graft on top of that you have placed the gtr membrane and in that scenario when you go about with the suturing technique always try periosteal suturing first which helps in stabilizing your gtr membrane as well as the bone graft underneath so how to go about with this suturing technique the materials required will be like as i said go with 6070 or 80 and the needle size will be of 10 to 30 mm 3 by 8 circle needle next slide see the first thing you have to consider is like can you see a um, uh, number 2 uh, written over there a periosteal releasing incision is planned this incision yes exactly correct the number 2 the pink mark on the brown area yeah the periosteal this is called as a periosteal releasing incision is planned uh, is to be given which is to be given exactly 3 to 4 mm beneath your graft area see if your membrane is coming on like uh, i i think you can see appreciate from the picture your membrane is somewhere like 3 to 4 mm above the incision periosteal incision so how you go about with the periosteal suturing here your first bite is started a pical from the incision either mesially or distally based on your wish start a pical to this periosteal releasing incision and go ahead with the vertical mattress suture come on the surface of the ridge and finish your uh, vertical mattress sutures on the other side by taking a periosteal suturing on the lingual side also 
it is further continued as a matter suture to the palatal side the suture is closed and tightened over the membrane till it get fixed to the bone see first you will be going ahead with the vertical mattress periosteal suturing on the mesial side tighten it properly so that your mesial side of your membrane is fixed properly then go go ahead with the distal suturing after distal suturing make sure that the membrane as well as the graft is not uh, is completely immobilized after which you can close the flap using uh, using uh, as i said uh, i prefer horizontal giving a horizontal mattress suture and if you are still insisting on giving a simple interrupted you can go ahead with uh, simple interrupted sutures also after the sutures are closed the rehydrated fixed membrane can be stretched by pliers until the bone graft is completely immobilized and fixed correctly next slide this is a uh, like pic pictorial representation of taking a periosteal suturing the first the picture a shows that the bite goes in the so first bite goes in and once it penetrates the tissue when it re enters back to the tissue you are taking a periosteal angrage you can see from b and c picture c and the second line the first picture you can see that they have taken a periosteal angrage and they have done a reentry to the flap tissue so this is called as periosteal suturing try to give a periosteal suturing the same way after giving a periosteal releasing incision so that you can stretch the tissue a close adaptation of the periosteum to the membrane uh, apical border of the gtr membrane is made next slide coming to the simple interrupted uh, you all know that it is useful to suture the divided papilla it actually reapproximate the edges of the papilla and close the soft tissue after biopsy also uh, the suture not as i said should be either on the buccal or the lingual side next slide this is the most commonest flap you're going to encounter in your um, implant procedure that is called as a three cornered flap so what are the suture specifications required in in this case is like next slide when you go ahead with suturing a three corner flap the first suture that is called as a key suture number 1 you can appreciate should be placed at the junction between the vertical incision and the circular incision that is called as a key suture hold the tissue properly put a simple interrupted suture in that area so that you are stabilizing that flap over there then uh, that is the first suture to be placed before placing the suture i want you guys to look at the above picture there is a periosteal elevator going inside that immobile tissue to elevate the immobile tissue slightly to make it movable so what happens by doing like that is that uh, the entire thickness of the mucos muco periosteum can be lifted and when you do a key node a key suture you actually uh, you are actually uh, giving the throw or taking the bite from the muco periosteum also so that your uh, flaps is like completely immobile and fixed properly at the corners next slide and then the fourth uh, the second and the third is a simple interrupted suture that you give you can see a dotted line surrounding that on the immobile area that is the area where they have lifted the muco periosteum also as i said uh, when you go ahead with the, giving a triangular flap like this on the movable tissue where the 4 1 2 3 is written already the muco periosteum will be reflected completely so i think you got the point of how to go ahead with the um, three corner flap suturing the first suturing should be number 1 the keynote suture before putting the keynote suture always try to lift the periosteum from the immobile tissue and go ahead with the keynote suture and followed by simple interrupted suture next slide suturing the leftover anatomical papilla uh, this case also we normally encounter tearing the papilla and all those things so in such cases go with the simple interrupted sutures in all the other areas or whichever sutures are like specified particular to that area and that uh, leftover anatomical papilla you, you can suture it by going ahead with a sling suture and again uh, 70 or 80 polyglycolic acid suture material and 8 mm needle is preferred then suture the vertical incision using simple interrupted sutures there is nothing much to talk about the sling suture uh if there is any leftover anatomical papilla try to connect the anatomical papilla and make it immobilize by giving a sling suture next slide coming to the recent advances and the last slide next slide 
so try to shift uh, your uh, usage of silk suture or your vicryl suture to something like barb suture or uh, uh, antimicrobial sutures but again while using antimicrobial sutures be cautious that the school of thoughts regarding the antimicrobial resistance or the bacterial um, uh, like uh, uh, the school of thoughts regarding the antibiotics should be uh, coming to your mind when you go ahead with a when you go ahead with choosing an anti antimicrobial sutures so like some bacteria will feel resistant and all those things will come so there are chlorhexidine loaded sutures there are triclosan loaded sutures there are silver nanoparticles loaded sutures so choose the suture wisely uh, and um, try to uh, give some variations in your suturing techniques also so never stick to silk suture or your vicryl suture try to use nylon sutures pga fa suture polyglycolic plain flour polyglycolic acid sutures and uh, there is something called as barb suture where you don't have to give a knot also the barb barbing present in the suture material will take care of that uh, knot security and all those things next slide this is a kind of electronic suture that has been placed this is also in a uh, recently introduced one normally when you have to monitor a tissue you have to see for the clinical values a clinical observation seen and you have to go for the radiological investigations and all those things to see what exactly is happening underneath the tissue underneath the soft underneath the sutured tissue so if you use something like electronic suture you can actually there is a sensor over there which can monitor the variations and you can actually see the wound integrity and the tissue micro motions from the sensor next slide it is not like uh, now coming to the barb suture this i think you can give a try ethicon is there strata fix it was introduced since uh, 2012 and uh, i have not even seen a single person using this thing so uh, i think you can give a try with strata fix also the barbs actually serve like a grip uh grip the tissue grip to hold the sutures uh hold the flaps in position and there is no uh, surgical knots because the barbs itself is taking care of that stability and there is no knot related complications the clinical advantages of the barb sutures includes it reduces the overall operating time you because you are not sitting there and throwing the uh, giving throws to tie the knot or you don't have to bother about the knot insecurity and the flap getting open and there is a lower rate of wound healing complications also related uh, uh, wound healing complications means any wound healing complication related to suturing or suturing knots can be reduced a lot by using barb suture next slide uh the last slide is a suture removal the things you have to take care is like uh, after a particular point of time uh, uh like uh, sorry uh, the first thing you have to consider while suture removal is like or when you choose a suture is like for how long i am going to keep the suture inside the patient's mouth don't keep on uh, uh, make the patient wait for the suture removal or just keep keep the suture just like that in the patient's mouth after 7 days in case of silk suture there is no point in keeping the uh, suture inside uh, the wound area because uh, it is going to give you more trouble than giving you the advantages the suture actually plays no role useful role rather than that uh, getting more and more bacteria accumulated into the surgical site Remo remove the suture by holding or by grasping the knot and cutting the silk or whichever suture where it enters the tissue always use diluted peroxide or chlorhexidine before going ahead with the uh, suture removal all these doesn't matter in case of normal things but if you want aesthetics if you want a proper healing result always go ahead with uh, all these protocols wash the area and try to uh, um, try not to contaminate that uh, heal well healed area once again by pulling whatever is there inside the suture inside the wound area a sharp uh, suture scissors should be used to cut the loops of the individual or continuous suture as you all know uh, next slide next slide that's all i think uh, now how you guys got an uh, now you you people got an idea what kind of suture to be used at least like the uh, the sutures or like a um, yeah thank you yeah thank you thank you ramya um uh, deepak are you there 
can we uh, on the videos of Deepak, uh, Ramya, and myself? I'll be owning it. Just the videos, three videos, so that. Stop sharing, yeah. Okay, Deepak. I think there are questions or not. Yeah, there's one. One <laughs> question. Deepak is there? I'm not able to hear you. Deepak. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you have to ask. A... Sir, uh, it is. Uh... Yes, Hello. Yeah, I'm hearing. Yes, sir. Uh, Ramya, it was a very informative <coughs> presentation. We, you, uh, we were able to understand in depth uh, sound knowledge about the entire procedures, what we do during connective tissue grafting or all those mic micro procedures where we used to go wrong earlier days. So we will be able to rectify them. <coughs> we, uh, I have few doubts regarding the uh, presentation. Uh, if we are using any magnification, what should be the minimum magnification needed for those uh, micro sutures? Now normally, we go ahead with 30 to 40 times magnification with the normal scope, uh, normal uh, uh, scope which you are using. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then uh, even with the armamentarium, you said uh, Castrovijo uh, needle holder would be better. Exactly, sir. Uh, and the suturing uh, needle also will be like of smaller size. And yes. whatever like, instruments we use for the microscopic kit is entirely different rather than our conventional uh, instruments. Conventional needle holders. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, when we are suturing the connective tissue, it's a it's a non-vascularized. Okay, so when we are putting the knot, uh, how will we get to know that that uh, how much uh, tight it is? You said that it should not be too tight or too loose. Whereas in vascularized area, when we place a knot very tight, we get we are able to see a little bit of blanching. Okay, sir. Okay. In this in this one, we will not be able to see the blanching. Okay, sir. The tightness in case of connective tissue graft basically yes, uh, depends on the uh, how well we can immobilize the graft. The tightness should it's be just, uh, just to immobilize the graft. It should be completely immobile. immobile. That, is the, um, that, is, uh, that is how we clinically uh, check how tight the suture is. Just to immobilize the graft. The, uh, the graft should be completely immobile. <laughs> Do we give any pressure dressing also over once the connective tissue graft is placed and the flap is approximated? Uh, okay, sir, that's a like uh, um, a really nice question. Actually, there are two school of thoughts regarding that. A uh, uh, few clinicians would like to place a perio pack or a pressure pack on top of the grafted area, but certain others uh, they don't prefer that. So the basic is like uh, ideally uh, for implant aesthetic procedures you want the bulk to come. You want the convexity to come around the implant surface for that aesthetic appearance or aesthetic profile. So when you try to give a pressure pack, you're going to compress the tissue more. The string gauge will be a little bit more, little more. Uh, okay. And blood clot will also go more thinner by applying a pressure pack. But if you leave the area and if the patient is able to maintain it properly, I uh, prefer not to give a pressure pack in such cases, sir. But if you feel that, if you feel the other way around, better to give, go ahead with the pressure pack. Okay. You also said that should be placed uh, insert on the connected tissue graft. Uh, yes, pre cut and uh, suture strand, uh, will it tra uh, uh, traumatize the flap which will be approximated over that? Sir, uh, in, actually in connected tissue graft, uh, the suture we choose is actually like a resorbable suture. And the suture thread material is also less, uh, a little like lesser diameter of 7080. So I, I don't think sir, it will be like uh, causing that much of trouble when we go ahead with the coronal positioning of the uh, flap or when you reposition the flap also over the surface of the craft. 
i don't think so sir that will be a problem or a matter of concern okay. and also with this uh, micro suture we are set my approximating the flap following the uh, inflammatory cycle there will be edema yes uh, so sir uh, can you repeat able to hold the uh, following inflammatory cycle ramya there will be yes, edema sir. getting accumulated over there uh, with okay, uh, that tension will will it cause mm -hmm. the wound to open here and there sometimes even if sir, it is well approximated uh, sir actually in case of graft uh, the graft getting edematous is like not going to happen because no, only no, the flap, flap flap okay flap, flap. Uh, sir flap flap below the flap okay, Be, okay uh, over the okay the flap is getting edematous and uh, i didn't get your question sir can you repeat it, uh, it because of uh, edema the flap yes, the wound margins most of the time we end up in dehiscence okay okay sir uh, hmm. with these small micro sutures uh, hmm. will the chances of dehiscence will be more if the edema will be uh, of larger volume Okay, sir. In conventional uh, procedures, uh, the wound will get dehiscence if the suture is like tightened more, or uh, I feel like the way we tighten the suture, or if uh, because of any procedural or patient's own medical complication is getting edematous. So if we try to control that, and uh, if we go ahead with the microsurgical part, uh, I think it definitely will put less mechanical pressure or mechanical. Uh, what uh, tension in that area when we go ahead with the micro surgical techniques the tension or the mechanical pressure that is going to come to the graft area or the flap is very minimal because the suture thread is very small and the uh, the suture bites are also uh, very minimal so i don't think so that will be a cause of concern resistance <laughs> will happen obviously okay. it can happen if the maintenance or the procedure goes wrong or the suturing goes in a very shabby way but uh, okay. if we can control all those things i don't think so sir with micro surgery the dehiscence will be a problem okay thank you, uh, thank you if anybody sir. has any doubts you can please ask in the chat box no? yeah i think there is no other questions i have uh, one or two questions to ramya um like do you have any any specific um, suturing material is required for uh, Uh, the connective tissue graft when you are doing in a sling in the anterior especially when you are trying to increase the uh, bulk uh connective tissue graft and sling sir uh, no no if you are using a connective tissue graft like in the sling technique like putting pushing inside when the channel technique to increase the channel, bulk, uh, yeah yes sir so what what kind of a suture material you uh, would recommend I would recommend like Vicryl Plus, sir. Okay, okay. And um, uh, yeah, sir, that is like my suture specifications. Like I would like to go ahead with Vicryl Plus because it's resorbable and uh, uh, it But can. Do you, think, uh, do you think we have strength in that? Because sometimes I uh, we found it that it uh, the knot doesn't sit well with that my Vicryl Plus. so this is my experience of saying so so how much what is the uh, indications of the what kind of knot and all uh, sir in such cases if you feel that the strength is not there i think you can go ahead with the increasing the number of sutures over there uh, first uh, after okay. giving that uh, yes sir after giving the holding sutures just to place uh, uh, to make sure that the placement is correct you can increase the periosteal suturing number of periosteal suturing or you can increase the number of holding suturing sutures placed around the connective tissue graft oh, okay okay with okay. one proper periosteal suturing i think the graft will get stabilized in that area <laughs> okay okay fine and uh, what is your experience about the barbed sutures because i have not used them anybody has used here either of deepak or anybody in the there are i think they use for right. this one sir uh, face lift surgery yeah because our students they have used sir uh, the iranian students so they went for training they just okay. pass the suture and they, it will be holding the tissues oh ho oh, oh, ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho 
they okay. just have to pass the uh, suture through it mm hmm yeah you got it because i don't have an experience about it no. um so probably we need to try one and see and any other people questions anybody is there no i don't think so anybody is either it is too much for them i don't know <laughs> and how many years of training we need <laughs> 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 yeah, this is, this is this is what I'm saying. This is I started saying in the first beginning that it, I'm still yet to learn a lot many things in this uh, micro suturing and things. So I myself felt that uh, it was very informative and uh, new things to learn and probably to try also. And uh, isn't it so? I think it was a nice presentation, Ramya. Thank you so much for your time and. Uh, I hope uh, people have the people who attended have uh, gained a good amount of knowledge to go back and start using these techniques amongst the case in the cases. I thank you again and Deepak, shall we close it up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ramya. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.